Jason in Antioch, California asks, I am pursuing a dual degree in political science and economics. After reading your books, How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes, and The Real Crash, as well as the work of several Austrian economists, Hayek, Hazlitt, and Murphy, I find that I will have trouble accepting the arguments of many of my Keynesian-influenced professors. Do you have any words of advice for the student of economics? Well, I was certainly in the same predicament that you were in when I went to college and high school, for that matter. I was arguing with my high school uh, professors, my history professors, and econ, and it went all through college. And, you know, you just have to learn how to deal with it. I mean, obviously, you know, you, some of the classes you can choose not to take if the professors are really out there. I remember when I uh, had my introduction to a government as a freshman at UC Berkeley, I, I went to a poli-sci class and it was a huge lecture hall with at least a thousand students uh, uh, in Berkeley. And I was so irate by what I heard that I went to the office hour of the professor later that day. And, I, I came in and she happened to be there and I said, hi, my name is Peter Schiff. I'm, I'm in your, you know, a poli-sci one course and I, I just have a question for you. I asked her, I said, are you a socialist? And she looked right at me and she said, no, I'm not. I'm a Marxist. That was it for me. You know, <laughs> so I dropped that course. But obviously there are a lot of courses that you have to take. Uh, and especially if you're the, that's your major. So look, you know, you, you go through the motions, you argue with your professors, uh, you got to you know, be a little bit respectful about it. Uh, but maybe if you're, if you're persuasive, uh, you'll win over more converts and you'll have some friends in the class. When it comes to um, the tests though, here's what you got to do. And I, I used to do this because I, I always knew the answers they wanted. So we, we would write our t exams in these blue books. And whenever there was a question uh, where, you know, I, I knew what the real answer was, maybe they said, you know, the economy is weak, um, what should the government do? And, you know, the answer is increase spending or cut taxes or some kind of stimulative plan. I would always start off by giving the answer that I knew was expected, the answer that would earn me the, the A. Right? So I would give the answer they wanted, and then at the end I would write a footnote and I would write, look, you know, I know that's the answer that you're expecting. Uh, this is just a little note to let you know what I really believe. This is not part of the exam, just a little note to you. So I would always try to put that out there and try to point out, but make sure you answer the questions the right way first so you don't run out of time. And then if you have some time and you want to go back with some little asterisks and, and, and point out why you think your answer is a bunch of BS, <laughs> then go ahead and do it. But know your professor. Make sure you don't agitate him because obviously you, you, know, you want to get a good grade. I suppose that's why you're there. Uh, but I definitely fear for, feel for you. Try to get your classmates to listen to the show. Uh, get them to read my book. You know. Uh, get, try to maybe get your professor to read my book. Start them out with how an economy grows and, and why it crashes because that's pretty easy to understand. Uh, so, you know, remember I wrote it so a congressman can understand it, which means pretty much anybody can understand it. So that might be a good place to start. Thanks for, thanks for your question. James in Galloway, New Jersey asks, if we had a bank holiday in the U.S. and banks were closed like what happened recently in Cyprus, does that mean I wouldn't even have access to safety deposit boxes where I have gold and silver stored? No, that, that's exactly what it doesn't mean. If you had a safety deposit, if you had gold in a safety deposit box, you would be able to go and, and withdraw the contents of your box. What the bank holiday has to do with bank deposits where you've loaned your money to the bank. Remember, when you open up a bank account, a savings account, checking account, you are a creditor of the bank. You have loaned the bank your money and the bank has taken it and gambled with it. Now, they figured you know, that even if they lose it, you know, the government's going to uh, you know, bail you out. But if the government has to shut the banks, uh, then you can't get your deposits but they don't stop you from taking your property, which is being stored by the bank, in a safety deposit box. So you rent the safety deposit box from the bank. You don't make them a loan. You're leasing that box and you're depositing into that box your personal property. The bank doesn't have a right to that property. Just like if you rent an apartment and you put furniture in the apartment, your landlord doesn't own your furniture. That's your furniture. Uh, and, and so even if he evicts you, you have the right to take the furniture. So you're, you're safe from a bank holiday. What you have to worry about 
when you put your money in a safety deposit box is in the event that the US government makes it illegal to own gold or silver or to the extent that the US government thinks you owe the money and they think you may be hiding it in a safety deposit box, they might be able to just go in there and take it. Or certainly uh, uh, they would prevent you from taking your gold out of it if they had a government agent there when it wasn't you in particular they were looking for, but they just were trying, it was illegal to own gold. If that ever happened, there probably would be a government agent uh, opening up all the safety deposit boxes and confiscating any gold that they found. And of course, if there was a criminal penalty associated with owning that gold, well, they'd also be uh, <laughs> sending you off in handcuffs. So that's why I'm against the, uh, the safety deposit box. So I think if you're going to own physical gold, store it yourself. You know, it's that's one of the beauties of gold. You can get a lot of money, you know, unless you're, you know, a Bill Gates or somebody, you know, you can probably get all the gold you need into a shoebox. And, you know, you could bury it somewhere, hide it somewhere on your property. No one's going to find it. If you just, you know, just don't forget where you buried it. Maybe make a map or something and just don't lose the map or don't, you know, but, but I think it's pretty safe to store. But, you know, we have storage facilities. I've got a lot of clients that are storing their gold in Australia, in the Perth Mint. We have clients that are storing gold through Europac Metals in Switzerland. So you can also have offshore depositories for your gold that I think are a lot safer than storing it in a US bank. But as far as the Cypriots are concerned, anyone in Cyprus who had gold in a safety deposit box didn't have to worry about anything because their funds in that bo in their boxes was n were never in jeopardy. It was only the people who had euros in a, in a bank deposit uh, that were threatened with losses and now there are real losses, not for the insured depositors, but for people who had large deposits, they're gonna take a big haircut but if you had 10, 20 million dollars worth of gold coins uh, in a Cypriot bank, you've got all your gold. You haven't lost anything. Chris in Alexandria, Virginia asks, if the Fed buys the majority of our government's debt this year, as it did last year, I believe, then why can't the Fed, when that debt comes due, simply not accept payment? They create the money, exchange the money for debt, the government spends the money, and then when the debt matures, it just disappears. Why wouldn't that work? Well, the debt may disappear, but the money that was created to buy the debt is still here. And that is the problem. It's the money printing. It's the inflation. You see, right now, the Fed is pretending that it can withdraw that liquidity. Well, the only way it withdraws the liquidity is when the government repays the debt or the Fed sells the debt uh, back into the market and, and gets cash. If the Fed just rips up the debt and doesn't ask for payment, then the liquidity becomes a permanent part of our money system to never be withdrawn. And if the Fed were to acknowledge that that was its game plan, then there would be a run on the dollar right now. The reason the dollar isn't going down is because people believe the Fed when it says it's going to withdraw this liquidity. Now, my point is, it's a lie. Why anyone believes it is beyond me, because the liquidity is impossible uh, to withdraw without collapsing the economy. And since the reason the liquidity is there is to artificially prop up the economy, the Fed's not going to pull the rug out from under it. Now, that doesn't mean they can do it forever, because at some point the market won't allow the Fed to print all this money, because there'll be a dollar crisis, and that will ultimately force the Fed's hand, because it'll have to uh, start stop buying and raise rates to stop the dollar from going to zero and, and unleashing hyperinflation, which will be far worse uh, than what would happen if the Fed allowed the phony economy to crash. But you know, one way or another, uh, we're going to have this huge crisis. Uh, the only question is, which road are we going to go down? But neither one of them uh, is going to be uh, a fun journey, um, except that one of them is going to arrive at a slightly less horrific destination uh, than the other. And then the question is, what do we do as a nation as a result of this catastrophe? But there is no easy solution. There are people that simply think the problem is the debt that the Federal Reserve has, that we owe the Fed this money. See, that debt really isn't the problem. As long as the Fed owns it, it's not even a problem. Because remember, all the interest that we pay to the Fed, the Fed turns around and gives it right back to the Treasury. They send the Treasury a check. Uh, so the problem is going to be when they have to unwind the, the, the balance sheet and the bonds collapse and they have to start sending the Treasury a bill uh, for all of the losses. Nick in London, Great Britain asks, 
given the level of austerity that much of the European Union and now the UK is facing, how much more beneficial would it be for these countries to reduce government interference and encourage a free market to repair the country's woes? Would the free market aid recovery better than government restriction, or do we need government to help sort this out? Well, the problem is, really, for all the talk of European austerity, they don't actually have any. I mean, they've raised taxes, but that's not austerity. Uh, in the classic definition, when the Austrians talk about it, we're talking about big cuts in government spending, where the people who have been living off the government, uh, they go through austerity not asking the people who have been supporting the government uh, to work harder, uh, but asking the people who have been living off the taxpayer uh, to get out of the wagon and help everybody else push. Uh, but we haven't had any true austerity uh, in most of the major European economies. In fact, France just uh, over the weekend uh, said that austerity is over. I mean, it never even started. You know, I said, you know, it, France announcing the end of austerity is like Michael Moore announcing the end of his diet. Right? He never went on a diet. Uh, France never really had austerity. They're giving austerity a bad name. They're saying, look, things are still bad, so austerity doesn't work. You know? But it wasn't tried. That's why it didn't work. Uh, but now they want even more government, so they're going to be, they want even more stimulus than, than what they had before, and it's not going to work. The only real solution to grow, to get growth, is to have a genuine uh, contraction in the size of government to free up resources to be used by the private sector. In the interim, there's going to be some pain as these reallocations move through the economy and economies restructure uh, to be more efficient and more viable and have real growth. But the politicians have no stomach for that. They don't want to level with the voters. They just want to be Santa Claus. And, and so Europe is going to continue to suffer. Uh, and that's really one of the main things that we got going for us in America. Because for now, all the stupid decisions they're making in Europe is insulating Americans from all the stupid decisions that are being made here. Because people are worried about the euro, uh, they're buying the dollar. They're worried about European debt, they're buying treasuries. That's propping up our economy. That's enabling us to spend more and borrow more than would otherwise be the case. And so we could postpone the day of reckoning. But unfortunately for us, uh, because it's been postponed, we're going to have a lot more to reckon with. And it's going to be a lot more painful. Phil in Montgomery, Alabama asks, when Rothbard talks about higher orders of production declining in a depression, it makes sense commodities like copper, oil, etc. are declining prior to the upcoming depression. Where does gold fit into an order of production schema? Is it a consumer good or a higher order? Well, I think it's neither. I think in, gold is going to have the role of money. So, uh, and so I think you're going to see a large increase in the dollar or other fiat currency price of gold. And of course, whether that comes with deflation or inflation, we don't know for sure. I think it's going to come with inflation. But it really doesn't matter because one way or another, gold is going to gain value relative to consumer goods, whether to capital goods or you know the factors of production. So real estate prices, stock prices will come down in terms of gold. Food prices, energy prices will come down in terms of gold. In any scenario that we have, I think you're going to see a deflation or decline in the overall price structure as measured in gold. And some prices will fall more than others. And I think capital goods, those higher order goods prices will fall more than consumer good prices. Uh, so that is uh, you know, a, a, def a decline in our overall standard of living. That's going to happen one way or another, whether it happens because the Fed does the right thing or the wrong thing, uh, that's too soon to know for sure. Uh, but my guess is going to be initially it's because the Fed does the wrong thing. Eventually, I hope it does the right thing. But it's not going to be because the Fed is acting preemptively. It's because we're, it's going to be staring into the abyss and realizing that there's no way out at this point. And maybe they'll do, do the right thing only because they've run out of all other options. And they realize just how horrific the consequences will be if they push this thing uh, to the absolute maximum uh, point and eventually they slam on the brakes. Uh, but because they waited so long and they had to slam so hard, it's gonna be one hell of a jolt.